Taliban leader says women will be stoned to death in public. The Taliban supreme leader, Mullah Haibatullah Akinzada, has declared intentions to implement harsh punishments, including public stoning of women, in defiance of Western criticism. Despite promises of a more moderate government, the Taliban has returned to severe practices like public executions and floggings. Akinzada justified these actions as in line with their interpretation of Islamic Sharia law, dismissing Western notions of human rights. The announcement has sparked outrage among Afghans, with concerns about the deteriorating situation for women under Taliban rule. Many feel increasingly restricted and unsafe, describing their situation as akin to living in a prison with diminishing hope for a better future. Defense Secretary meets with Israeli counterpart as tensions grow. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant at the Pentagon to discuss the escalating tensions between the US and Israel over the conflict in Gaza. They focused on minimizing civilian casualties in Gaza and increasing humanitarian aid access. Austin proposed alternatives to a major military operation in Rafah, suggesting precision targeting of Hamas leaders instead. The US is urging Israel to diversify aid entry points into Gaza and collaborate with international partners. The meeting follows Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's cancellation of a delegation to Washington after the U.S. abstained from a U.N. Security Council vote on a ceasefire resolution for Gaza. Netanyahu criticized the abstention, expressing concern over Hamas's continued hold on hostages amid the ceasefire. Israeli woman who was held hostage by Hamas speaks out on her abduction and sexual assault in Gaza. Amit Susana, the first Israeli woman to publicly discuss her ordeal, reveals she endured sexual assault and violence during her 55 days in captivity following the Hamas-led attack on Israel on October 7, as reported by the New York Times. Abducted from her home by at least 10 men, Susana suffered beatings, chaining, and forced sexual acts under threat. Released in late November 2023 as part of a hostage exchange, her testimony sheds light on the psychological and physical torment she experienced. The Hostages Families Forum hails Susana's bravery in advocates for the return of all hostages. Dr. Ayelet Levi Shakar highlights the prevalence of abuse suffered by hostages and urges their immediate release. A UN report suggests sexual violence occurred during the attack, a claim Hamas denies. Israeli President Isaac Herzog praises Susana's courage and condemns Hamas crimes against women. Hamas tells mediators it will stick to original position on ceasefire. Hamas has reaffirmed its commitment to a ceasefire proposal that includes the withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza and the return of displaced Palestinians. They also demand the release of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails in exchange for Israeli hostages held in Gaza. The United Nations Security Council recently adopted a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire, with the U.S. abstaining from the vote. Egypt and Qatar are working to mediate between Israel and Hamas, as the humanitarian crisis in Gaza worsens. However, Netanyahu's office dismissed Hamas' proposal as unrealistic and vowed to continue the ground offensive until Hamas is eliminated. Israeli delegation leaves Qatar negotiations after Hamas rejects latest hostage release proposal. After Hamas rejected terms for a hostage release deal in negotiations in Doha, Qatar, an Israeli delegation left the talks. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office condemned Hamas for its unrealistic demands and lack of interest in continuing negotiations. Israel reiterated its commitment to achieving its goals in the conflict, including the release of all hostages and the destruction of Hamas military capabilities. Meanwhile, Israel is considering launching an invasion of Rafah, a Gaza city bordering Egypt and a stronghold for Hamas, despite warnings from the Biden administration against such action. The cancellation of an Israeli delegation's trip to Washington followed the U.S. decision not to block a U.N. resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Netanyahu has vowed to proceed with the offensive, with or without U.S. support, in pursuit of fully dismantling Hamas. Trump urges Israel to finish up its Gaza offensive and warns about global support fading. Former President Donald Trump expressed support for Israel's response to the October 7 attack by Hamas but urged them to conclude their offensive in Gaza swiftly to avoid losing international support. In an interview with Israeli newspaper Israel Hayam, Trump emphasized the need for Israel to achieve peace while cautioning about declining global backing. He criticized Israel's release of images from the offensive, suggesting it damaged their global image. Trump's remarks come amid ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, with casualties on both sides and international scrutiny of Israel's military actions. 
Additionally, Trump reiterated his stance regarding American Jews' support for Democrats, accusing President Joe Biden of backing Israel's adversaries. Fetterman rejects Harris' suggestion that Israel could face consequences for Rafah invasion, hard disagree. Senator John Fetterman criticized Vice President Kamala Harris for suggesting potential consequences on Israel if it proceeds with an invasion of Rafah. Fetterman argued that Israel has the right to confront Hamas, holding the group accountable for civilian casualties. This comes amidst tensions between President Biden's administration and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government over Israel's plans for Rafah. Harris emphasized the humanitarian concerns and lack of alternatives for civilians in Rafah, leaving the possibility of consequences open. Arab nations surrounding Rafah are hesitant to accept Palestinian refugees, fearing Israel's refusal to allow their return. Netanyahu has agreed to send a delegation to Washington to explore compromises, while the Biden administration stresses the need for civilian protection in any military action. Israel announces thwarting of massive Iranian operation to smuggle weapons to Palestinians. Israeli security forces announced on Monday the foiling of a large-scale Iranian operation aimed at smuggling advanced weaponry to Palestinians in the West Bank. The operation, uncovered through an investigation into Hezbollah and Iranian operative Munir Makhda, revealed attempts to recruit agents in the West Bank for carrying out attacks against Israel. The cache of seized weapons included various explosives, grenade launchers, anti-tank missiles, rifles, and pistols. This development occurs amid Israel's ongoing campaign against Iran-backed Hamas in Gaza. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu faces opposition from the U.S. regarding a potential invasion of Rafah, Hamas stronghold, with President Biden's administration warning against it. Netanyahu had previously agreed to send officials to Washington for negotiations but cancelled the trip following the U.S.'s failure to veto a U.N. resolution demanding a ceasefire. Israel-Brazil crisis over Lula Holocaust mentioned blowing over, says Israeli ambassador. Brazil's diplomatic crisis with Israel, sparked by President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva's comparison of the Israeli war against Hamas to Nazi genocide, is beginning to ease, according to Israel's envoy in Brasilia, Ambassador Daniel Zonshine. Lula's remarks, made during a visit to Addis Ababa, drew strong condemnation from Israel, leading to a reprimand of Brazil's ambassador to Israel and strained relations between the two countries. Despite the lack of an apology from Lula, there have been no recent inflammatory statements from either side, indicating a potential improvement in relations. However, Brazil has not clarified whether it proceeded with a contribution announced by Lula to UNRWA, a UN agency aiding Palestinian refugees, which Israel accuses of having Hamas members among its staff. Israel has agreed to provide security bubble for Gaza Pier project. Israel has agreed to provide security for a temporary pier that the U.S. military plans to build in Gaza to deliver humanitarian aid. The pier, promised by President Joe Biden amid concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, aims to address the imminent famine threat. Under the plan, the Israel Defense Forces, IDF, would establish a security bubble to protect U.S. personnel building the pier and ensure the safe offloading and distribution of aid. The IDF would also secure the pier physically. The agreement comes after Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin discussed the importance of humanitarian aid with Israeli Minister of Defense Yov Gallant. However, details about the project's implementation and security responsibilities remain unclear. Lawmakers from both parties have called for briefings to address safety concerns for U.S. troops involved in construction and aid distribution. Pentagon urges alternatives in Israel meeting with few details. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin expressed concern over the high civilian casualties in Gaza and the humanitarian crisis during a meeting with Israel's defense minister, Yov Gallant. The Israeli invasion of Gaza, aimed at Hamas, began in the north and has now targeted Rafah in the south, where many civilians are sheltering. The potential invasion raises humanitarian and diplomatic concerns, including strain on Israel's relationship with Egypt and the flow of aid into Gaza. The U.S. is involved in efforts to address the crisis, including plans to construct a pier for humanitarian aid delivery and discussions on alternative approaches to the situation in Rafah. However, tensions arose earlier when the U.S. abstained from a U.N. resolution urging a ceasefire, leading to the recall of Israeli negotiators from talks in Qatar and a halt to planned visits to Washington. Despite these challenges, both countries are engaged in ongoing dialogue to address the situation in Gaza and seek ways to mitigate civilian suffering.
Lebanese Sunni militant group head says coordination with Shiite Hezbollah is vital to fight Israel. Al Jama al Islamiya, a Lebanese Sunni political and militant group, has joined Hezbollah in fighting against Israel on Lebanon's border. They cite Israel's actions in Gaza and strikes on Lebanese areas as reasons for their involvement. The group coordinates closely with Hezbollah and Hamas, with whom they share similar ideologies. Despite historical tensions between Sunni and Shiite sects, cooperation between these groups is rare but has strengthened in the current conflict. Al Jama al Islamiyah's armed wing, the FAR forces, has claimed responsibility for attacks on Israel, resulting in casualties. They emphasize self reliance in weaponry and deny receiving external support. While they are not seeking to replace Lebanon's political figures, they assert themselves as partners in building institutions and generations. UN Security Council for first time demands Gaza ceasefire as US abstains. The UN Security Council passed a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, marking a significant shift as the United States, Israel's ally, abstained from vetoing it. The resolution calls for a ceasefire during the Islamic holy month of Ramadan and emphasizes the release of hostages seized by Hamas in October, which triggered Israel's military campaign. While the resolution drew applause and calls for implementation, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu expressed disappointment, vowing to continue the war until the hostages are freed. Hamas welcomed the resolution and indicated willingness to engage in talks on a prisoner exchange. Despite the resolution being non-binding, U.S. officials expressed disappointment at Israel's cancellation of a delegation visit to Washington and reiterated their stance against a potential Israeli assault on Rafah. Russia's attempt to push for a permanent ceasefire in the resolution was unsuccessful. Countries at UN rally behind expert who accused Israel of genocide. Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories, asserted to the UN Human Rights Council that Israel's actions in Gaza amount to genocide, urging for an arms embargo and sanctions against Israel. She accused Israel of having genocidal intent in targeting the Gazan population. Her remarks received support from numerous countries, mostly Arab and Muslim nations, advocating for sanctions and condemning Israel's actions. However, Israel and its ally, the United States, rejected Albanese's assertions, labeling her mandate as biased against Israel. The EU called for independent investigations into the allegations but recognized Israel's right to self-defense. The conflict's death toll was cited, with Hamas's attack on Israel leading to significant casualties on both sides. Colombia threatens to break ties with Israel if it doesn't comply with a UN ceasefire resolution. Colombian President Gustavo Petro threatened to sever diplomatic ties with Israel if it does not comply with a UN Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. This threat came after Petro celebrated the resolution's approval and urged other nations to suspend ties with Israel if it doesn't halt its military offensive in Gaza. Israel responded by vowing to continue protecting its people and accused Petro of supporting Hamas terrorists. Relations between Colombia and Israel have cooled since Petro took office, with Petro describing Israel's actions in Gaza as genocide and suspending military purchases from Israel. This deterioration in relations jeopardizes Colombia's defense capabilities as it relies on Israeli companies for maintaining its fleet of jets and for military communications equipment. Pompeo rips U.S. decision at UN, says it thrilled Hamas. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo criticized the Biden administration's decision to abstain from a UN Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas conflict, stating that it pleased Hamas and other adversaries of the US. The resolution called for an immediate ceasefire during Ramadan and the release of hostages held by Hamas. The abstention upset Israel, leading Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to cancel a government delegation's visit to Washington. White House spokesperson John Kirby defended the abstention, citing the absence of key language condemning Hamas in the resolution but affirmed ongoing support for a ceasefire and hostage release. IDF strikes dozens of terror targets in Khan Yunus, Gaza, raids Alamal Hospital. Israel continued its military operations in Gaza, targeting dozens of terrorist sites, including Alamal Hospital, and claiming to have killed Hamas fighters. The IDF emphasized precision to avoid civilian casualties. A UN Security Council resolution for a ceasefire during Ramadan was passed unanimously, with the US abstaining. The resolution calls for an unconditional release of hostages and increased humanitarian aid to Gaza.
The U.S. abstention caused tension with Israel, leading to the cancellation of a planned delegation visit to Washington by Prime Minister Netanyahu. U.S. Embassy in Paris issues security alert for Americans in France after Moscow terrorist attack. The American Embassy in Paris has issued a security alert for U.S. citizens in France following a terrorist attack in Moscow. Heightened security measures are expected in public areas, including tourist sites, public transport, and places of worship. The French government raised its national security alert to the highest level after the attack in Moscow, where radical Islamists killed 139 people at a concert hall. Italy has also increased security around Holy Week observances leading up to Easter. Both countries will increase surveillance and checks, particularly in crowded areas and sensitive targets. Pope Francis has a busy schedule of events in Rome and at the Vatican during this period. France will soon deliver 78 howitzers to Ukraine to meet Kiev's urgent needs, defense minister says. France has announced plans to deliver 78 Caesar howitzers to Ukraine and increase its supply of shells to meet Kiev's urgent need for ammunition amid Russia's invasion. Defense Minister Sebastian Lecornu revealed an agreement among France, Ukraine, and Denmark to finance the howitzers, aiming for quick delivery. France also plans to deliver 80,000 shells for 155mm guns this year, up from 30,000 since the war began. Additionally, France is participating in an initiative led by the Czech Republic to identify available stocks of gunpowder and ammunition outside the EU. This initiative seeks to provide 800. 000 artillery shells to Ukraine, with at least 18 countries participating. Le Cornu emphasized the need for European countries to reduce reliance on the U.S. for security, especially amid concerns about potential changes in U.S. policy towards NATO and Europe's security. The move comes as efforts to secure new funds to arm Ukraine from the U.S. have stalled in Congress. Ukrainian missile attack hits Russian warship and reconnaissance vessel, Navy says. Ukraine's Navy has announced that a missile attack struck a Russian naval reconnaissance vessel and a large landing warship, which Moscow captured from Ukraine during the annexation of Crimea in 2014. The strike, which occurred during an attack on Crimea over the weekend, targeted the Konstantin Olshinsky landing ship with a Neptune anti-ship missile, rendering it non-combat capable. Another vessel, the Ivan Kurz reconnaissance vessel, was also hit. This attack is part of Ukraine's efforts to counter Russia's Black Sea Fleet, using naval drones and missiles to inflict damage. The Konstantin Olshinsky Previously a Ukrainian warship, was captured by Russia in 2014 and was being prepared for service against Ukraine before being struck. Ukraine has destroyed four out of 13 large landing ships belonging to Russia, with others undergoing repairs. The ongoing battle in the Black Sea is crucial for Ukraine's efforts to maintain access to international markets for its exports despite Russia's attempts to impose a de facto sea blockade. Ukrainian Navy says a third of Russian warships in the Black Sea have been destroyed or disabled. Ukraine has dealt a significant blow to Russia's naval capabilities in the Black Sea, sinking or disabling a third of all Russian warships in just over two years of war, according to Ukraine's Navy spokesman, Dmitry Plitinchuk. The latest strike occurred on Saturday night, targeting the Russian amphibious landing ship Kostyantin Olshinsky in Sevastopol, Crimea, which was previously part of the Ukrainian Navy before Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. The attack, carried out with Ukraine-built Neptune missiles, also damaged Sevastopol port facilities and an oil depot. Plitinchuk stated that Ukraine's goal is the complete absence of Russian military ships in the Azov and Black Sea regions. These successful strikes have provided morale boosts for Kiev and helped create more favorable conditions for Ukrainian exports from Black Sea ports. While Russian officials have largely remained silent on Ukrainian claims, previous Navy losses have been confirmed by Russian military bloggers and media, prompting criticism of the military's response. Recent reports suggest a leadership reshuffle within the Russian Navy, with Admiral Alexander Moiseev replacing Admiral Nikolai Yevmenov as Navy chief. Ukraine ramps up spending on homemade weapons to help repel Russia. Ukraine is bolstering its defense industry to enhance its military capabilities against Russia, amid delays in foreign weapon supplies and ongoing conflicts. With nearly $1.4 billion allocated in 2024 for domestic weapons development and procurement, a significant increase from previous years, the government is prioritizing local production to meet urgent demands. Private sector involvement has surged with privately owned factories emerging as key players in the defense industry, contributing to increased efficiency in production. 
Entrepreneurs like Anatoly Kuzmin are driving innovation, repurposing facilities to produce essential weaponry such as mortar shells. However, challenges persist, including bureaucratic hurdles and manpower shortages, highlighting the need for continued reform and support. Despite these obstacles, Ukraine's defense sector has seen remarkable growth, particularly in drone technology, which has proven effective against Russian forces. While Ukraine remains reliant on Western support, its expanding domestic capabilities signal a determined effort to strengthen its defense infrastructure and combat Russian aggression. Russia's FSB chief accuses Ukraine, US and UK of being behind Moscow shooting. Russian security agencies have accused Ukraine, along with the United States and Britain, of involvement in the attack on a concert hall near Moscow that killed at least 139 people. The director of Russia's Federal Security Service, FSB, Alexander Bortnikov, claimed that the attack was facilitated by Western Special Services and that Ukraine had directly assisted Islamist radicals in the Middle East. However, Ukraine and its allies denied these accusations, labeling them as lies and utter nonsense. Bortnikov provided no specific evidence for the claims, but the accusations reflect hawkish thinking within the Kremlin elite. The United States has intelligence confirming ISIS's claim of responsibility for the attack, and earlier shared information with Russia about a planned attack in Moscow. President Putin vowed to punish those responsible for the attack, attributing it to radical Islamists, but also suggested that the attackers were attempting to flee to Ukraine. Former Hungarian insider releases audio he says is proof of corruption in embattled Orban government. A former Hungarian government insider, Peter Magyar, released an audio recording alleging a cover-up of corruption by top officials in Prime Minister Viktor Orban's government. The scandal erupted following revelations of a pardon issued to a man involved in covering up child sexual abuse at a state-run orphanage, leading to widespread protests and the resignation of close Orban allies. Magyar's recording features the voice of former Justice Minister Judith Varga discussing the removal of evidence from court records to conceal corrupt activities. Varga accused Magyar of domestic violence but did not deny her presence in the recording. Magyar, who has previously accused the government of corruption, plans to establish a new political party to challenge Orban's grip on power. He has targeted Antal Rogan, another Orban ally, and called for the government's resignation. Thousands of demonstrators gathered in Budapest demanding independent investigation into the alleged corruption and the resignation of the Attorney General. Magyar's rise highlights growing discontent with perceived corruption and autocracy in Hungary's political system.